So as I said in my last video about how to get started in reverse engineering, one of the best ways to jump in is to start by reverse engineering your own code. So as an example, I've written a very basic hello world. Um, this might actually seem really, really simple, but it's not going to be as simple as you think. And I'll show you why in a minute. So this is a uh, Visual Studio, uh, Visual C++. Um, I'm going to set the mode to release, which is what you would usually get if you were receiving a, uh, a production version of an executable. Um, I'm going to set it to x86 and then I'm just going to build. So in the project folder, we're going to see the release folder, which is the type we compiled and we've got our test project. And here we've got the PDB file, which I'm going to go into later. So I'm going to open the binary up in IDA and we'll be prompted to see if we want to load the PDB file, which is what I showed you earlier. Now, what this is going to do is it's going to load the debug symbols. Now this will actually make reverse engineering a lot easy, but in the real world, it'll be very rare that you'll actually come across a, um, a debug symbols file. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to load it first without the symbols. And we're going to see what it would typically look like if we were reversing this software had it not been written by us, like we had found it in the wild somewhere. So the first thing you're going to notice is it takes us to the start routine, but that's not actually the start of the application. That is the start of the CRT startup. So that's setting up the C runtime library. Uh, it does the initialization code. And then finally, it's going to take us to the main entry point. So one of the questions that a lot of uh, new beginners struggle with is how do I get to the main entry point? Because all of this code is, is just default C library code. We don't need to reverse it. The code that we actually need is the entry point. So I'm going to show you how to do that. So a normal entry point might actually look something like this. And this is going to return the value zero to the operating system when the application finishes running. Now, when we do void main like I've done, which is a function that does not return a value, it actually internally does return a value. It's the same exact code. So when we use the, the void specifier internally, it will actually return the value zero and that value will be hard coded. So that's how we're actually going to get to the entry point is that we know the value from main is going to be returned to the operating system. So what we're going to do in IDA is we're going to go to the very end of our startup function and we're going to work backwards. Now in assembly, the return code is always in the EAX register. Uh, if it's x64, it's going to be the RAX register, but we're working with the x86. So we're going to look for anywhere that modifies the EAX and we're going to work our way backwards. So if we look at this function, it actually doesn't touch the EAX, so we can ignore that. And then we're going to work backwards. Here we see EAX is set to a static value, which is not zero. It's zero FF. So we know that's not where we need to be going. So we need to now take this other path, which is here. So if we go up, go up, we see EAX is set to the ESI register, which means our return value is stored in ESI. So now we need to keep going up and find out where ESI is set. If we just keep going up and keep going up, we'll find ESI is set to EAX here. Now, as I said, EAX is the return value, which means EAX was sent, set by the last function that was called, which is this one. So the return value is in the EAX, it's moved to ESI. We do probably some cleanup code here, and then right at the end, we move it back into EAX. So that function is actually where we want to be looking. So that's how you would find the entry point in a Windows application. And whether it's Win32 or console, it doesn't matter. It's still going to follow that same procedure. Now, this might vary like a little bit depending on which compiler is used. But as long as it's Windows, it should be somewhat similar. Linux, on the other hand, most uh, Linux uh, ELF files will actually have symbols embedded. So when you open a Linux binary in IDA, it will usually take you immediately to the entry point, which is very helpful. But unfortunately, with Windows, we have to go through all of this just to get to the entry point. So I'm going to show you what the application would now look like if we did load the debug symbols, which we won't always have. What we can see now is it's actually named all the functions. 
And that's because when you compile with debug symbols, it stores the real name of all of the functions into the symbol file. So we're actually seeing variables, function names, you name it, how they're actually written in the code. So all of this is the CRT code. And then we have our main function here, which is our entry point. Uh, an underscore is added by the, that's uh, something to do with the C calling convention. So it's underscore main instead of main, but this is our main function. And it's actually taken us straight to the main function because Ida knows that underscore main is going to be the main function. Whereas if we didn't have the symbols loaded, we would not have the name underscore main. Therefore it would just take us to the application entry point, which is here. At, from the entry point, we have the CRT startup, which jumps into the main code we were looking at earlier when we got to the entry point by going backwards. So that's everything I wanted to show you in this video. I definitely recommend writing your own code and just changing it around a bit just to see how it looks in the disassembler. Make sure you can actually get the entry point with symbols disabled, as that's going to be very important for when you're reversing real code. Um, I'm going to be trying to come out with a new video or two every week. If you if you like what I'm doing, uh, like and subscribe. I'm on Patreon, link is in the description. And if there's something you'd like to see me specifically do a video on, leave a comment and I'll, uh, if enough people are interested, I will do a video.